Story Time. I'm interested to know if anyone else has had experiences in or around the area of Sullivan County. I've camped there with family on two different weekends and went up hiking a few times as well. The local shop seemed to sell Bigfoot apparel but I didn't know of anything strange going on until I had an experience a couple years ago. Me and my wife and kids were tent camping at a campground in Muncie Valley, a decent, well-populated campground. This was our second year staying at this campground, not having anything strange happen the first time. Well the first night, my wife woke me up to go get something from the truck, because she was hearing weird noises outside and didn't want to go herself. At this point I was half asleep and coming to and all of a sudden heard loud whoops coming from the woods. Now my first thought when I woke up was there ain't no way I was leaving this tent and going out there, but I eventually got the courage and did so. We both heard these noises. Well just recently, we were talking about that night because we are going back up in a couple weeks to camp, and she mentioned that before I woke up she was hearing what sounded like a pig getting slaughtered, and that shocked me. That's pretty much the story. That same night, when we got to camp though, it was pretty late and I had to pump up everyone's air mattresses so we ended up leaving the campground to go down the road and pump them so that we weren't being loud and where we pulled off and I got out of the truck was a very creepy place and I was very on edge for no real reason which was nerve wracking. I was just wondering if possibly anyone on here had experiences in that area, or possibly even dog man since I read a couple things about sightings of that as well. I was hiking in Colorado on a less traveled trail at the beginning of winter. It was fairly nice when I left my house, roughly 45 degrees. It was supposed to be a 16 mile hike. I had climbed this mountain before, but I wanted to take a different route this time. The normal route is well marked, and relatively well traveled. The route I was taking was not. My dog and I are a few miles in and it starts to snow. Just some flurries, not too unusual for Colorado. I am pretty comfortable in the woods and an all-season hiker, no big deal. My dog is in front of me, she is pretty good at staying on a trail. We walk a few miles more miles and it starts dumping snow. The trail completely disappears. In fact I wasn't on a trail at all. I realize in my overconfidence that I didn't download a map or a bring paper one. I also realize I didn't tell anyone I was going hiking. I look around, I am in the middle of the woods, no map, snow dumping, no idea where I am, no cell service. I was hiking uphill the whole time, so I continue climbing whatever mountain I am on. I come up to a clearing and I realize I can see the peak of the mountain I am supposed to be on. I pull out my flint stick which has a shitty little compass on the back of it, take an azimuth. I didn't want to use my phone in the off chance I needed to conserve battery. I dead reckon down the mountain, towards the peak of the mountain I wanted to be on. I hiked for 3 miles through the snow until I finally hit a trail. The trail looks like it is generally going in the direction I want to travel. So I stay on it. I end up hitting a marker I recognize. I continue my hike, and summit my mountain. At the top I texted my friends, shared my location, and downloaded the map. Ended up being 22 miles but still made it to dinner on time. Lesson learned, don't be an idiot. For many years I have been haunted by something I saw in the back country of Wisconsin. It was early spring and I was headed down a dark country road around 8 p.m. south of Barron, Wisconsin. Surrounded by trees, I drove over a hill and then a little way down the other side, I saw the reflection of green eyes near my driver's side window about 4 feet high. I was confused because they were right by my window and I didn't see anything in the road ahead of me a second earlier. It was like it was trying to be invisible and had appeared just a moment too soon. I drove a little further and decided to turn around to see if my eye played a trick on me or, if it was indeed, an animal of some kind. 
As I approached my mind world because my brain could see an animal there but then an overwhelming sense of fear overcame me when I could not assign a known animal to it. I pulled up to it, now about 20 feet or so from it. I was horrified by this time and knew in my heart that I could not take my lights off it or I would die, or so my gut told me. In front of me stood a creature that was 4 feet, but approximately 5 to 6 feet tall to the top of its head. It had the head of something like a cat, and the muscular body of a dog, but was the size of a cow and very lean. It had cat-like ears but in short type of snout, but overall was definitely not a cat. It had cocoa brown fur with dark brown zebra-like stripes running down its sides. It also had a dark brown mane running down its back. Its green eyes were in the front of its head. Out of fear, I flashed my headlights at it and then honked my horn hoping it would run off. It only looked as if I infuriated it as it brought its head down to the ground keeping its eyes on me as if it was threatened. Several times, the thought crossed my mind that it, in fact, was strong and big enough to bash the windshield, rip me out of the car, and eat me alive. I knew it wasn't going to be the one to back down after flashing my lights and honking at it so I decided to keep my lights on it and back down the road in reverse. I did just that as it intensely stared at me as I reversed about a quarter mile, then did a U-turn in the road and peeled out of there. Nobody has before or since mentioned this creature anywhere I have read. Now as far as animals go, it was way too big to be a deer, too lean and muscular for a deer as well. It had cat-like features but was much too tall to be a large cat of any kind. It was way too tall to be any kind of dog definitely not a cow like I've ever seen. I lived and hunted in that area for many years so I was very in tune with the animals native to the area. I sure hope someday I find someone else who has experienced this demon-like animal. In August of 2019, I loaded a bunch of camping gear onto my bicycle and spent the better part of the next 7 months riding 5,300 miles around the US. I most often preferred to wild camp, so rather than staying in proper campgrounds, I would just find a place to disappear into the woods for the night. In late September, I was wild camping somewhere in rural Montana. I was quite a ways out there, far from the nearest town. I went off into the woods and set up camp. After using the last few minutes of sunlight to eat some dinner, brush my teeth, and write in my journal, I laid down to get some sleep. Over the past month or so of sleeping in the woods, I had grown very accustomed to the nighttime sounds of the forest. The chirping of crickets and croaking of toads can be quite loud. There was always at least a slight breeze rustling the leaves of the trees. It was always a highlight of my night. Though not particularly uncommon. To hear the distant yips and howls of coyotes, and one night I was very excited to hear two owls, one on either side of my tent, hooting back and forth. So that one night in Montana, it was quite alarming to be surrounded by a completely silent forest. There was not a single sound to be heard. Even the air was dead still, with no breeze to rustle the dry leaves of autumn still clinging to the trees. And it was honestly terrifying. On that night, there would occasionally be the snapping of a twig or some other such sound that normally would be lost in the other commotion. But that night, there was no background noise to mask the few sounds that did pop up, and so all of those little twig snapping type things seemed 100 times louder. On that trip, I slept in some very loud places, like the night I pitched my tent right next to some train tracks that ended up being much more active than I thought. I shared a hostel room with a guy who snored and a bunkmate who talked in his sleep. Both in the same night. But that night of absolute silence in the woods of Montana was the worst night of sleep of the entire 179 day trip. It was the loudest silence I've ever heard, and that absolutely terrified me. I've always been drawn to the wilderness, the sheer untamed beauty of it. There's a peace that comes with being far away from the world, with nothing but trees, mountains, and sky for company. That's why my best friends and I have been taking camping trips together for years. It's our way of unwinding, 
of getting back to the simple things. But in the summer of 2019, one trip to the Montana wilderness changed all of that. It left us with something far darker than peace. Something I'm not sure any of us will ever fully recover from. It was me, my buddy Matt, and his younger brother, Jake. We'd planned this trip for months, choosing a spot deep in the Absorica Beartooth Wilderness, about three hours from any semblance of civilization. Matt had heard about this place from a fellow hiker. A vast stretch of forest and mountains where few people ventured, even during peak season. Perfect for what we were looking for, a week off the grid, no cell service, no distractions, just the three of us and the wild. We arrived in mid-July, the sky clear, the air fresh and warm. The trailhead was at a remote parking lot, and from there, we hiked about 10 miles to a spot Matt had picked out on the map. It was perfect. There was a small clearing beside a pristine river, framed by towering pine trees, with mountains looming in the distance. It was everything we'd hoped for. We set up camp, built a fire, and settled in for what we expected to be a week of fishing, hiking, and just enjoying the solitude. But from the very first night, things felt off. It started with small things, little details that only now stand out in my memory. That first night, as we sat around the fire, roasting marshmallows and talking about nothing in particular, there was this eerie silence that settled over the woods. Normally, the wilderness is full of sound. Crickets, owls, the rustling of leaves in the wind. But that night, it was as if everything had gone still. No birds, no insects, nothing. We joked about it at first, calling it the calm before the storm, even though the sky was clear and calm. But then Jake noticed something strange. Hey, you guys hear that? He asked, his voice low, almost hesitant. Matt and I stopped talking, listening. At first, I didn't hear anything. But then, faintly, there was a sound. It was like a distant hum, low and rhythmic, almost like a chant carried on the wind. I glanced at Matt, expecting him to laugh it off, but his face was serious. Probably just the wind through the trees, he said, but there was an edge to his voice. We all nodded, trying to convince ourselves that it was nothing, but the rest of that night, we couldn't shake the feeling that we weren't alone out there. The next day, we set off on a hike up one of the nearby ridges. The views were stunning. Rolling forests, jagged peaks, and the river snaking through the valley far below. But as we hiked, that same strange feeling hung over us. The forest felt. Wrong. I don't know how else to describe it. The further we went, the more uneasy I felt, like we were being watched. Every so often, I'd catch Matt or Jake glancing over their shoulders, too. At one point, we came across something odd, a circle of trees where the ground was barren. No plants, no grass, just dirt. In the middle of the circle, there was an old, weathered stone, maybe three feet high, covered in strange carvings. It looked ancient, but it didn't belong there. Like it had been placed deliberately in that spot. I remember standing there, staring at it, a chill creeping up my spine. Matt broke the silence. Let's keep moving. None of us argued. We left that clearing behind and continued up the ridge, but the sense of unease never left. That night was when things truly took a turn. We had just finished dinner and were sitting around the fire again, talking about the hike, when we heard it. The same hum from the night before, only this time it was louder. Closer. It wasn't just the wind. It was something else, something deliberate. Matt stood up, looking toward the trees. You guys stay here. I'm gonna check it out. Are you crazy? I said, but he was already grabbing his flashlight. Jake and I exchanged a look, but neither of us wanted to let Matt go out there alone. So, against my better judgment, we followed him into the woods, our flashlights cutting through the thick darkness. The hum grew louder the deeper we went, and soon, it wasn't just a hum. It was a voice. A low, guttural chant, coming from somewhere up ahead. We followed it, our steps slow, cautious, until we came to a small, open glade. And that's when we saw them figures. Standing in a circle around a fire. There were seven or eight of them, dressed in dark, 
tattered robes, their faces hidden beneath hoods. They were swaying, chanting in that strange, rhythmic way, and in the center of their circle was a large stone altar, similar to the one we'd seen earlier in the day, but this one had something lying on it. Something alive. It was an animal. A deer, or what was left of it. Its body covered in blood, its chest still faintly rising and falling as if it was somehow still clinging to life. One of the figures raised a knife, the blade catching the light of the fire, and I realized with horror what they were about to do. Jesus Christ, Jake whispered, his voice trembling. Before we could react, Matt stepped forward, his flashlight shining directly on the scene. Hey! What the hell are you doing? The chanting stopped. The figures turned in unison, their heads snapping toward us like one entity, not separate people. For a moment, no one moved. My heart was pounding so hard I thought it would burst out of my chest. Then, without a word, the figures scattered, disappearing into the trees like shadows, faster than any human had the right to move. We stood there, frozen, unsure of what to do. My legs felt like they'd turned to stone. The fire in the clearing still burned, and the deer lay on the altar, its eyes wide open, staring into the night. Matt started to move toward it, but Jake grabbed his arm. Don't, he said, his voice barely a whisper. We need to get out of here. We turned and ran. We didn't stop until we were back at camp, panting, terrified, barely able to speak. We packed up our gear in record time, not bothering to douse the fire or check the tent. We just needed to leave. The hike back to the trailhead felt endless. Every snap of a twig, every rustle in the bushes sent us into a panic. We didn't speak, we didn't stop to rest. The whole time, I felt eyes on us. Watching, waiting. By the time we reached the truck, it was nearly dawn, and we were too exhausted to do anything but drive. We never talked about it after that. Not really. Whenever I see Matt or Jake now, there's this unspoken understanding between us, a shared memory we all wish we could forget. But we can't. That place. Those people, whatever they were. It still haunts me. It's been years, and I can't shake the feeling that something followed us out of those woods. And I know one thing for sure, I'll never go camping in the Montana wilderness again. I'll never forget the day I hiked through Red River Gorge and encountered something that still sends chills down my spine. As I was trekking along the trail, lost in my thoughts, I walked right past my doppelganger. It was surreal. We both gave each other a polite nod and a casual hey. I remember the moment feeling oddly normal, like I was just passing a fellow hiker. But then, as soon as I registered what had happened, he turned and vanished around a bend in the trail. It took my brain a second to catch up, snapping me out of my hiking trance. I stood there, heart racing, trying to process what I'd just seen. How could someone look so much like me? It felt like a scene straight out of a horror movie, and yet, there I was, alone on the trail, wondering if I had just crossed paths with a ghost. Or something even stranger. So I climbed Half Dome with my brother when I was 18, we made it an overnight, because it's a strenuous hike. Now, I'm about to turn 31, and I'm interning in Sacramento, and I'm feeling old, so I get the brilliant idea to prove how young I still am by climbing Half Dome since Yosemite is so, relatively, close by. I didn't have a permit though, you need to apply well in advance, but there was a lottery system. Problem was, you apply, pay a fee don't get it, apply, pay a fee, don't get it. Well, fast forward a bit, because 2018 was a bad year for wildfires. All of a sudden, I win the lottery. I put in for a day off of work, I tell my parents I'm going for a hike, and their immediate response is, hey, there's a wildfire near Yosemite, so maybe don't? But I just won the lottery, and surely the automated system wouldn't have given me a permit if I they didn't want me climbing half dome. Now, I do two things right. 
1. I preload detailed maps of Yosemite trails and pre-plan the route, and I make sure to get a big area around it just in case. 2. I am incapable of not overpacking, so not great for keeping weight down, but great for having a bit of redundancy. I wake up at 3 the next morning and drive to Yosemite. First thing is that no one's manning the front gate, but it's open and I've got a national parks pass, so I go right on in. So I'm driving through and then the next thing is that there's a fork in the road. One way goes to Yosemite Valley, the other goes around it. The road to Yosemite Valley, where my hike starts, is closed. You see, the wildfire had gotten closer, and they had evacuated Yosemite Valley. But the other way is clear. So I'm sitting there at like, 6 o'clock in the morning, and there's no reception, so I can't look up any other routes to Half Dome and it's too early for big brains so I forget that I have a detailed map of Yosemite already loaded in my trail app, so I just start driving along this other road. Eventually, I get to a restaurant that's just starting to open, no reception still, but I go in and ask, is there any way to get to Half Dome without going through the valley, and this guy is super helpful. He shows me this big map of Yosemite, shows me where we're at and points to a trailhead that goes to Half Dome starting at Tanea Lake. I find it on my trail app, so I start driving there. Get to the trailhead, and here's the one smart thing I do all day. I leave a note on my dashboard explaining where I'm going and when I expect to be back. Of course, even though this is a smart thing to do, I'm still a dumbass, because they're busy with a wild fire. I certainly didn't see a single park ranger while I was in the park and I'm pretty sure my car could have stayed there a few days before anyone noticed. Now, one thing I noticed after planning my new route on the trail app, is that I'm adding like 10 additional miles to my hike. It was like 24 miles. So I'm like, that's fine, 3 miles an hour, add a couple because of half dome, no problem, still a doable day hike. I brought water for the 14 mile trip but I have water filtration, and there's plenty of streams on the map, don't count on streams on a map. So, of course there's a wildfire not too far away, there's smoke in the air. NBD. I brought one of those masks you wear when you're using spray paint that I wore while I was hiking. Better yet, I had a gas mask that I always keep in my car just in case. If things got really smoky, I could wear the gas mask. LOL. Like I said, I overpack, but that doesn't mean I'm being smart. I start hiking. Small mistake here, I forgot to start tracking myself until I'd gotten a bit away from my car, but not so far that I'd have trouble finding it surely, because obviously I'd be getting back in the daylight. LOL. So I start out, I've got a great pace, I'm like, completely alone in the wilderness. I come up to a fork in the trail. Basically there's two ways to go to Half Dome, one of them's a bit longer, but the other goes up a mountain called Cloud's Rest, can you guess why it's called that? So I checked the route I had plotted, I'd already chosen to go left instead of right, so that was fine. I keep going. Now at this point, everything's going fine. I cross paths with three people on my way to Half Dome, a mother and son who had been camping, and a guy returning from Half Dome. Other than that, no one's there. No cell reception, no park rangers. I make it to the very bottom of Half Dome having already passed the last person I'm going to see that day, I've made decent time. Still confident. I start climbing up and up and it sucks, but I'm alright though I've slowed down a lot. Now, I get to the that tier before you actually climb the dome of Half Dome, and it's really rocky, and there's no well-defined trail, but the actual start of the ascent is in sight so I just go the way that looks easiest. K almost falling off a cliff. My feet slide out from under me. I catch myself, but I'm really close to the side of this route to the cables up the side of the mountain, and I'm like realizing, if I fall, there's no cell reception, and no one to hear me yelling assuming I even survive the fall. Keep in mind, no one is on half dome. I am the only person on this mountain. I backtrack and take a less easy, but also less perilous route to the cables. So for those of you who don't know, Half Dome gets to a point where you're all but climbing straight up. There are wooden planks and metal cables that go up the side to the top of the mountain. It looks frickin' perilous, 
It is frickin' perilous, I'm exhausted, and have no business climbing, but. I did overpack. I had a lightweight hammock and the heavy duty webbing that connects it to trees is really high strength. I literally fashioned myself a harness, and using a carabiner, I latch into the cable and every time I get to one of those wooden planks, there's a metal post holding the cable up and I grab on, unlatch and relatch, and continue climbing. It gets to the point where I'm basically taking a breather every time I get to one of the wooden planks. This is a whole body workout. I safely get to the top, it's hazy because of the smoke, I can't actually see the fire anywhere, but it's still beautiful, and I enjoy having a mountain to myself, I enjoy having a mountain to myself so much, some subliminal part of me must have decided to arrange an encore. So I climb down, and this is where the fun really begins. My arms and hands are shot and it's less a controlled climb down as I let myself slide to each board using the cable to stay upright. After the cables, I start climbing down the rest of the mountain and this is torture. I don't know if you've ever done a lot of steep hiking downward, but it murders your knees. Or at least, it murdered my knees. One bright spot, sort of, not really, I'm on the side of a mountain, so I actually have reception, so I call my parents. I know full well by this point that I'm not getting back before sunset, and I know my mom's going to worry, so I'm like, hey, I won't get back for a while, but I'm fine, and I'm not about to get swallowed by a wild fire, and I have plenty of water, yes sir, I had plenty of water, and hey, I'd passed a bunch of streams on the way, so even if I ran out it was no biggie. My mom's still worried, but I've still told her I'll probably get back to my car at around 7 or 8, so that was a lie I told my mama. I keep hiking and then I get to a stream, and I've literally just ran out of water, so I stop to filter some. Now I've got two water filtration systems, I overpacked. One is a bag that attaches to a pass-through filter. Fill the bag and then squeeze it through. I'd never used this before, I did not have my sweet water in Sacramento. The other one was a UV light purifier. It doesn't filter anything but it's supposed to kill everything with UV. I had also never used this one before and I didn't really trust it, I could have at least filled its reservoir, so I went with the pass-through filter. It was a pain in the ass. The sun was going down, getting down half dome took me a bit longer than I thought it would, who would have guessed? So, I filter some water, but I want to get back to hiking, and there were plenty of streams I'd passed, and I could just filter more later. So right at this point I've made two mistakes. One, I didn't filter enough water, obviously I knew this and was ignoring my common sense. Two, I brought a backup battery for my phone. Using GPS all day, it needed to be recharged, and I didn't want the cables to get messed up in my pocket, so I'd put it in my backpack to charge. I'd stopped regularly checking to make sure I was on the right path. I had no idea I was making this mistake at the time. So I continue hiking. It takes me a bit, but I'm thinking to myself, I'm doing more uphill than I remember there being downhill on the way, but I'm exhausted, so of course it feels worse than it is. Then, eventually, I look behind me, and I'm like, relative to half dome off in the distance, I'm way too high up. I pull my phone out of my backpack. I'm off course. I'm heading towards the peak of clouds rest. But here's the thing. I'm a fair bit off course. The sun's getting lower in the sky, and remember, it's actually a shorter route, it'll get me back to my car all the same. I keep going. I get to switch backs and start powering up them. I realize I'm starting to run out of water, again. I start stopping to catch my breath every few switch backs, then every couple, then every one, and then I run out of water. Now, I'm confident, so confident that I can easily climb back down. The spot where I'd filtered water was in fact the fork in the road I missed. I can go down, get water, and be on my way. But surely that would take more time. I've already climbed most of the mountain, and I can see on my map there's a stream not long after I get to the top, I'm a dumb ass for relying on this, I know. So I keep going, and I keep telling myself, you're not going to get less dehydrated if you stop. Now here's where I get my second dose of existential dread. I come across a backpack that's been torn apart, 
the contents strewn apart, no water. So two things cross my mind. Some dude died up here and his body was dragged away by a bear, or someone else made the same dumbass decisions I had and they decided the only way they were getting to the top was to ditch most of their gear. I didn't ditch my gear, leave no trace and all that. I did pull out my two-way radio and cycled through the channels, just in case I could reach someone to say, hey, maybe there's a dead guy here. No one answered, of course. No cell reception. No park rangers. I took a picture of the pack and made note of the coordinates. Nothing else for it but to keep going. Eventually, I reached the top. Beautiful sunset, it's going to be dark soon, but I've got two flashlights, extra batteries, and a hammock, if I decide I can't go any further, overpacked, remember. I've still got a ways to go before I get to that stream though. I haven't peed in hours. You're not going to get less dehydrated if you stop, because you're going to die if you stop. The ground's evened out though, and even dehydrated, and really feeling it, I get a second wind and I power through. I am serious about thinking I'm going to die if I stop though. I've literally got salt crystals I'm rubbing off my face from all the dried sweat. I overpack though, so I've got oral rehydration tablets in my massive first aid kit, I just need some water to take them with. Now, as I said, it was a dumbass mistake to assume this stream would be there just because it was on the map. It's gotten dark at this point, but. I find the stream, there's actual water, and this time, I'm filling up. I use my UV light because it's faster, and because I just don't care about anything anymore. I sit there for a while, purifying batch after batch of water. At this point I'm done with F-ups. I just have to deal with the ones I've already made. It's dark, so I'm using a flashlight to see the trail. It's downhill, but worse than downhill, it's this very rocky path and between the two, I'm killing my knees and going very slowly to avoid twisting an ankle. At one point my watch vibrates to let me know I've got a text message and I realize I've got cell reception and I call my mom to basically say, yeah, I've still got hours of hiking to do but I'm alive and I definitely have enough water this time, BTW I'd planned food for a day hike, I was going to stop at a nice restaurant for a hearty dinner, so I haven't eaten anything but a snack since my lunch, which is fine. At this point I've just got to finish the hike. Downhill is slow and torturous, even ground is where I get my third, fourth, and fifth wind, and uphill just sort of sucks. I try very hard to get back to my car before midnight, I wanted my day hike to be a day hike, but I miss it by about 15 minutes. Cue a moment of panic where I get to the end of the trail and can't find my car. I knew full well that I just had to travel in the right direction to the road I knew was there and then follow it to my car, but still. So I find my car, I get a Gatorade from a vending machine near the exit of the park, eventually get cell reception and text my mom to let her know I made it out and make it to the place I was staying at the time at about 3 in the morning. Called in sick because there was no way I could go in after that. My legs were wrecked after that. Wound up in PT. Not terrible, could have been worse. All in all, I survived in spite of every effort to make the absolute worst decisions. Now here's the point where I confess that not only was I a sergeant in the army who was actually very good at map tracking and had had strenuous training on not dying in the wilderness, but I'm an Eagle Scout. I knew each and every mistake I was making, but I was overconfident, and a way too stubborn. I'd spent a bunch on the stupid lottery, and I was sort of desperate to prove I wasn't too old for this shit. I refused to put the trip off when I learned about how close the wildfire was to Yosemite. I refused to turn around when I saw the valley was closed. I tacked on 10 miles to my planned trip and figured it was no biggie. I didn't top off my water every chance I got. I didn't turn around when I realized I was climbing a mountain. I didn't turn around when I ran out of water. I was all alone, and I got lucky. So anyway, went back the following year with friends. Still overpacked, starting in the valley has a lot more elevation gain than I remembered. But no duh, but I never came close to dying.
So I was through hiking in Vermont and I wanted to push myself to get to the next shelter the guide said it was 5 miles away but in reality it seemed double that. Anyway I found myself caught in the dark trying to follow the white paint marks on the rocks. The wind was howling and I was starting to get scared I missed the shelter since it had been so long. Eventually I made it to the shelter only to find it was packed along with all the tent sites so I had to go off the path to find a place to set up. I finally said F it and set up my tent in some area that had enough space. I fell asleep absolutely terrified the wind would knock a tree or large branch over. Here's the actually scary part. I woke up very early to what sounded like two people approaching my tent. I was off the path and away from the shelter no one should have had a reason for being out there. They walked right up to my tent and stopped not saying a single word then they split up one going to each side. I had a little 3 inch blade which I pulled out. My food bag was outside and I knew I couldn't continue without and I didn't want to die in my tent from someone I couldn't see so I figured it'd pop my head out and get this over with I quickly unzipped my tent and said good morning it wasn't people it was two massive moose. Luckily they looked young and instead of turning me into pace they both took off in opposite directions I swear I could feep the ground thud as they ran. I was so terrified they might come back I packed everything up there and started hiking to the next shelter. My name is Francisco and I am from Buenos Aires, Argentina. I am passionate about cryptozoology and the paranormal. The number of sightings of alleged cryptids and creatures in the US is enviable and fascinating. However, my country is not far behind. Among the many creatures that supposedly inhabit my beautiful country, from lake creatures and unknown hominids to aliens, elementals, and lost souls, there is one that I believe is the protagonist of this story. In Argentina and other regions of South America, particularly Paraguay, southern Brazil, and northern Uruguay, the legend of the lobby zone, which you might call a werewolf, is quite well known. According to popular legend, the seventh male child born to a family with exactly seven male children, without exceptions, transforms into a lobby zone at age 15. Years ago, It was not unusual for the nation's president to act as the godfather of that child to prevent any tragedies arising from superstitions. The story I'm about to tell you may not be extraordinary, but I have always found it interesting, and I think it represents the legend above quite well. This story happened to my maternal grandmother, who shared it with me when I was a child. To provide some context, my family lived on the outskirts of San Miguel. a city just 30 kilometers from the capital Buenos Aires we resided in a working class neighborhood that was quite precarious with dirt streets and plenty of greenery you could say it was a semi rural area returning to the story it dates back to the 70s or 80s one night my grandmother heard a pack of dogs barking and running seemingly going back and forth around the entire block without stopping at one point She looked out the small window that faced the street and saw the pack of dogs, but with the peculiar sight of a furry gray blur passing in front of them. I call it a blur because she spotted it in the blink of an eye, but it appeared to be a large, furry creature leading the group of dogs. At that moment, my grandmother felt a sense of imbalance and instinctively lowered the window curtain. The next day, she went outside to see if what she had seen the night before had left any traces. Among all the paw prints left by the dogs, she noticed a furrow cutting through their trail, which seemed to indicate that something had crawled by. Perhaps it was a fairly long tail. The question is, what animal or entity did my grandmother see that night? In this area, we don't have wild animals or anything like that. The largest carnivore in the country is the puma, but they live deep in the mountains, hours away from where the story took place. This completely rules out that option. To add to the story, there was a rumor in the neighborhood that this being was none other than Mr. Pepe, an elderly man who lived on the corner of my grandmother's house. It was said that on certain nights, he would turn into a werewolf to sing his sorrows to the full moon and roam the dark streets of the neighborhood. Despite its simplicity, I believe this story well represents the idiosyncrasies and folklore of my country, 
as there are many tales of local residents being the so-called Lobby Zone. I recently read an intriguing story in the media about a man who, in his youth, lived in the province of Misiones, in the town of Santa Ines, a jungle area in the north of my country. He claimed that the grocer in his neighborhood would leave town once a week to become a werewolf, but he did no harm to his neighbors. Out of respect, the townspeople maintained a pact of silence about the situation that man endured. I was hiking the CDT in Colorado about a day north of Dillon and Silverthorne and was crossing a deep little creek that was giving me trouble. Another guy caught up to me and found a better crossing a little off the trail, so I used it, talked to the guy for a bit and walked another mile or so and set up my camp. The other guy did too. In the morning I left early and hiked up a steep slope and along a ridge where the other guy caught up to me and stuck with me like glue. He started talking about hiking the rest of the trail together, but I didn't want to and I said I had stuff to do off the trail at various places further along. This guy didn't get it and started saying we could save money buying food together and planning meals and stuff. I said I was fine how I was and was a picky eater anyway. I started changing my pace, going faster and slower but I couldn't get rid of the guy. There's a brutal roadwalk past Pettingal Peak that climbs a pass up toward Vasquez Mountain and I bolted up there but the guy was killing himself trying to keep up and started telling me I was being mean and should wait for him so we could hike together. I wanted nothing to do with this guy and kept going, but as I was hiking around Vasquez Peak I stopped for a few seconds to grab food and he caught up again. He started saying I was lucky he caught up in time for us to set up camp together and started saying it would make more sense if we just set up one tent and shared it so there's less work and it would be warmer. I have a one person lightweight tiny tent. I grabbed my pack and left, went back around Vasquez and straight down the mountainside to a forestry road with this guy following me again. It got dark and hard to see but I was on the forestry road by then and heading into Winter Park. A few miles before town there was a forest fire and some forestry crews working on it. They were all back at their camp just off the road, so I went to them and asked if I could put up my tent just behind them in a clearing. A few minutes later I saw the other guy go past. I was jumpy and a little scared after that and got off the trail in Grand Lake for a few days, went to Denver and bummed around. Got back on the trail and was a little paranoid at first, but didn't see the guy again and when I asked other hikers if they'd seen him nobody recognized the description. I'm 6 foot 2 inches and 200 pounds, but I'll take wild animals over that guy any day. Myself and a buddy went on a 7 hour hike through some designated state wilderness. The hike was beautiful, with lots of mountainous terrain, chaparral, and oak woodland. However, we reached this one area and instantly got creeped out. It was a stretch of trail that followed a dried creek for about a mile. The area was an open oak grove, with lots of waist-high weeds and brush, but relatively flat. It was very quiet, but not that you are being watched and in danger kind of quite. The vibe felt more like we were trespassing. My buddy and I were trying to figure out why it felt that way. We were also a bit stone lol, but I've found that if you are at just the right level of high, you become a bit hypersensitive to your surroundings. So we are on alert as we are walking. And we come to a part where I can see the dry creek to my right and I get a good view of the opposite bank. There on the opposite bank is a pile of bleached white deer bones. Then it suddenly clicks. We are in a mountain lion hunting ground. The terrain is perfect, low-hanging oak branches, relatively flat ground for chasing down prey, near to a source of water to draw deer and other animals. Lots of concealment for a stalking predator, especially in the brush or up in the trees. Me and my friend stepped up the pace, knives at the ready, and got out of there as fast as possible without running. Fortunately, we didn't see a mountain lion, and once we cleared the grove, the creepy feeling abated. But yeah, not a comfortable experience, especially when you're miles from help and civilization.
I was day hiking. Not alone, but rather with my dog, Greyhound. I tried to do a new area park or trail area every couple of weeks with him. We were in a new park area I was not familiar with, and all I really had with me was a bottle of water and a small pocket knife. We came up on an area of the trail that was obviously a party area for kids, trash, fire pit, broken bottles and cans. The smells of the area really got my dog's nose, and the rest of him interested, but I decided to backtrack. Just too much stuff for him to get into. As I turned and went to reel him in on his leash, term I used, not a retractable, he let out this blood-chilling yelp. He had a front and rear paw almost instantly covered in blood. I had not had him for very long, newly retired racing hound, and was just becoming familiar with the breed, they can be bleeders. I really panicked for a minute while he tried to go down on his side to lick his paws. I didn't want him to lay on something that could cut his side. Not knowing what else to do I picked him up like a sack of flour and carried him back the way we came. I laid him down on some leaves and tried to clean his paws, he was not having any of it, and eventually saw that he had a piece of bottle glass between paw pad on his right front and rear paws. I plucked them out, maybe not the best idea, and tore up my t-shirt to staunch the bleeding. It was toast from carrying him just a few dozen feet with him struggling anyway. I was about a mile from the trailhead, which was parked with a playground, and just picked him in and started moving. I had not seen a soul on the trail before or after. When I came to the trailhead I must have been a sight. A few parents from the playground, and kids, came over to see why a shirtless kinda bloody guy was carrying a 75-pound fawn, their first impression, out of the woods. One guy helped me get my dog in the back of my SUV where I had some towels to lay him on. He was still bleeding and I wanted to get him to the emergency vet, but I had a whiteout event from adrenaline wearing off after my jog through the woods with my not small dog in my arms, using muscles in a way I was not used to. Kids were crying, folks asking if we needed a ride to the local vet, this was just before smartphones really took off, and just needed a minute before starting the car. All this time, after he realized he was getting a free ride and lots of attention, my dog never made a peep. The emergency vet managed to clean and pack his cuts, which were pretty deep, and my dog got pampered more than usual by my girlfriend at the time, now wife, when we got home. Screwed up thing is I had to go back the next day to check out the site where the glass was, it was a personal mission because I could not believe I walked my dog into that. That stuff was sticking out of the trail like little punji sticks. Someone had gone to the trouble of actually burying it with long shards about an inch out of the ground for several yards all along that trail. It was a county park, so I called the county police to let them know, and pretty much stayed away from that park from then on. I have done a lot of solo hiking and backpacking, but that whole 90 minute ordeal, dog cut, carry, drive and vet triage, was what I recall as the scariest thing I had experienced on a trail. Well, this was way back in 2006. We lived in an old farmhouse on Hargis Creek Road in Waynesburg, Pennsylvania. Our house was actually bought and torn down to be the new West Green Elementary School. I was 11 at the time. It was a Friday night in the start of the weekend so I was allowed to stay up as long as I wanted. My mom was upstairs asleep. I was downstairs in the living room watching Adult Swim on the TV. The next thing I heard was an upstairs door slowly open. And the sound that followed after that was somehow going down the stairs on all fours like a dog or an animal. Little 11 year old me was just wrecked with fear and beginning to turn around to see what was making this noise. Whatever this thing didn't waste no time. It came flying through the living room doorway and leapt onto my back pinning me to the carpet. It was like this shadow person with a slender figure. It also had this long flowing hair that went all the way down its back. It had a very slender woman-like figure frame. I want to say it was at least five and a half to at least six feet tall. It was hard to gauge as it was crawling. Anyways I'm just laying there with this thing on my back freaking out. It had me locked in a wrestling starting position. It didn't have a feeling to it. 
just felt like something heavy wrapping itself around me. I'm trying to call out to my mom but the only thing coming out is strained whispers. This thing had me in some sort of waking sleep paralysis state. I'm fearing and bracing for the worse. But it never did anything other than that. Also after a few moments of this thing holding me, I could feel myself getting more and more tired. And before I knew it I passed right out. And there I awoke in the same position the next morning with Saturday morning cartoons playing on Cartoon Network. I passed it off as a bad dream. I never saw this thing for years but I feel like it was still hanging around. My dad had remarried and I don't want to speak ill of anyone but let's just say she liked to have a few drinks. Good stepmom. Just a troubled person. We had some strange activity at my dad's house after this. Never anything at my mom's house though. Doors opening and slamming in the night, waking up in fear in the middle of the night for no reason at all. My blankets getting pulled sometimes and I'd wake up sometimes in that same sleep paralysis state but it wouldn't be there. Now I only saw this thing one other time. And that was one night a couple months before my stepmom sadly passed from a DUI related injury. I was a fully grown man at the time in my mid-twenties. I was sitting on the couch at my dad's watching some late night anime on Toonami. This time it didn't bother me or anything. It just crawled right down the hallway to her bedroom. I wanted to share this story with someone. I really can't find a reasonable explanation for what happened that night. It was just a strange and alarming experience. This happened a few years ago. My friend had heard that the northern lights might be visible in our area and asked if I wanted to go for a drive out into the country to see if we could catch a glimpse. So we headed out after dark and drove for a few hours, just searching for a good vantage point. After a while, we started to give up on seeing the lights. My friend realized that we were close to her hometown, and noted that she had been wanting to visit the local cemetery to find the graves of some of her distant relatives, she had recently been researching her genealogy. It was a clear, warm night, and we were both a little disappointed that we hadn't seen the lights, we both wanted to make the trip worthwhile, so we agreed to swing by the cemetery. We found the graves, took some photos, and just wandered around for a little while. My friend was leading the way, using the flashlight on her phone to light the path and ensure that we didn't accidentally step on any of the graves. I had been feeling increasingly anxious since we arrived, which struck me as odd, I have done several cemetery seriation projects as an archaeologist, and don't normally feel nervous in cemeteries, even at night. In fact, I usually find that cemeteries are pretty peaceful and calming. But I felt really strange in that cemetery, and found myself frequently spinning around because I felt like someone was standing behind me. Still, I just chalked it up to general anxiety and tried not to dwell on it. One of the problems with having an anxiety disorder is that it's sometimes hard to tell when your nervousness is justified. Even in retrospect, I don't know if my anxiety was just in my head or if it was related to what would happen next. After wandering for a while, we realized that it was approaching 1 am and that we should probably get back home. We headed toward the car. The car was in sight and my friend was a few yards ahead of me when it happened. I suddenly got that nervous feeling again, and thought that I heard someone running up behind me. I was starting to turn my head to look back when I felt something collide with my back, right between my shoulder blades. There was a weight behind it, as if someone had actually hurtled into me. The impact was so forceful that I was thrown forward and fell flat on my face, and as I scrambled to get back up, I felt the weight hitting me in the shoulders again and was shoved back down. I glanced up to see my friend running toward me. She had also heard someone running up to us, had heard my initial fall and had turned just in time to see me being pushed back down, she would later tell me that she had seen my hoodie flattening against my back and shifting, as if someone had been pressing their hands against my shoulders. She grabbed my arm to pull me up just as the weight disappeared and we both bolted to the car jumping in and instinctively locking the doors. She wasted no time starting the engine and then hastily peeled out of the driveway. As soon as we hit the road we just sped away from there. We drove for several minutes without saying a word. I think we were both stunned and, 
more than anything, confused. She finally glanced at me and said, what the hell just happened? I didn't quite know how to answer that. I told her that someone had shoved me to the ground, and she said, I know. I saw. But what was that? There was nothing there. We tried to come up with a rational explanation, but none of them made any sense. Had someone ambushed me and then bolted? Definitely not. We would have seen them. Had I tripped? No, I had definitely felt something pushing me, and my friend had seen me being shoved back down. Had it been the wind? Not possible. There hadn't been so much as a breeze that night, and if there had been some freak gust of wind, it would have hit my friend, too. Perhaps an animal had attacked me? But that didn't seem possible, either. There were no local animals large enough, strong enough, and stealthy enough to topple a full-grown human without being seen. I had been in full view of my friend, illuminated by her flashlight, during the second fall, and the weight had remained at my shoulders even as she was coming right up to me. She should have been able to see whatever had been pushing me. But there was nothing. We just couldn't explain it. Whatever had pushed me, twice, it hadn't been visible to us. As the adrenaline faded, I noticed something else, my back hurt. Right between my shoulder blades, right where I had felt the impact, I could feel a sort of stinging, prickly sensation. It felt like my back had been brushed with stinging nettles. I mentioned this to my friend, and she insisted on pulling over to look at my back. She switched the hood light on and pulled the collar of my hoodie down to look. I heard her mutter, WTF? She took a photo of my back and showed it to me. The skin between my shoulder blades was reddened, and several little blisters had started to appear, they later swelled up and popped, it was as if I had gotten a sunburn or a chemical burn. There weren't any scratches or cuts, it was a relatively subtle mark, but it was still clearly there. We certainly couldn't figure out how I'd gotten burned. I hadn't rubbed up against anything, I hadn't touched my back. I'd been wearing my hoodie all night and there were no tears or marks in the fabric. And it hurt. It continued to sting for several days. I couldn't sleep that night. My back hurt, and every time I started to drift off, I'd suddenly sense that someone was standing over my shoulder and I would startle awake. I couldn't really understand what had happened at the cemetery, but it truly rattled me. I don't know if I believe in things like ghosts or demons, to be honest. But I know that something truly bizarre and frightening happened that night, and my inability to explain it, to account for every strange little detail was deeply disturbing. It's been really difficult to grapple with this. I already have PTSD from a previous assault, and there is something profoundly unsettling about the fact that, in this instance, there is nothing I could have done to defend myself, and with no clear explanation for it, there is no way for me to prevent something like this from happening again. I've had several odd nightmares since then, dreams that are similar to the nightmares that I'd had for years when I was growing up. I don't know where they came from, but for as long as I can remember, I've had dreams in which a creature is attempting to lure me in one way or another, and in the dreams I usually understand this creature to be a devil or a demon. Sometimes it takes the form of an old woman. I had one dream when I was about 13 years old in which I was wandering through a forest. I came across a little cottage with the old woman standing by the porch. She beckoned me inside, and I acquiesced. We spent some time casually talking and baking cookies, but I felt uneasy around her and got the sense that she wanted something from me. At one point I glanced out the window and noticed a group of people standing in the yard, calling out to the old woman. I asked who these people were, and I vividly remember what she told me, they want me to take them in, but I don't want them. I want you. In other dreams, it has had a more sinister appearance, but I always recognize it as the same creature. I sometimes have dreams in which it is sitting in the dark at my bedside, whispering to me. It has a shadowy appearance with long, lanky limbs and empty eye sockets, its teeth are made of razor wire, and there is something like blood or wine gleaming on its lips. Like this. In those dreams, I can hear it whispering but can't understand what it's saying. Sometimes I have dreams of the same creature sitting in a chair in the corner of my room, eating a rotten apple. I have long suspected that this creature is some manifestation of my deepest and most troubling fears. 
I know these are just dreams, but I mention it because those dreams had subsided in my early 20s, but the incident at the cemetery rattled me so much that they've returned. It seems to have shaken my understanding of the world around me, opening the floodgates to my own inner demons. In these new dreams, the creature is standing upright behind me at the cemetery, time seems to be slowing down, I can see my friend frozen ahead of me, and the creature is whispering at my back. I don't know why my mind is conflating that dream creature with my encounter at the cemetery, but the fear has increasingly kept me up at night. Anyway, I just wanted to share this, because I have no idea WTF happened that night. My friend believes it was a ghost, but I don't know. I've just never personally experienced anything like this. I really don't know what to do with it. Some background, I live in the mountains so I hike a lot. My partner and I normally hike together but sometimes we split up where my partner will run up to a predetermined point on the trail while I hike up, I have asthma so running is not something I can do anymore. My partner normally waits for me at the predetermined spot and we either hike down together or keep hiking up together. One morning we went before work and split up. The plan was for my partner to wait for me halfway up the trail. While I was hiking, I felt on edge. This trail runs through the forest for a long way and normally you hear lots of birds and squirrels but this time it was silent. I get anxious at times so I chalked it up to that and kept going. I get to a turn in the trail where I'm hiking past a lot of low brush and I hear what sounds like a growl. Still thinking I'm just freaking myself out, I clear my throat very loudly in case there is something I can't see, I will startle it out of the brush. Nothing moves so I keep going. I get maybe 100 feet further and I run into my partner running down the trail. They look frightened and just say there's a cougar. Turns out my partner decided they didn't want to wait for me so they had started hiking back down the trail towards me. They rounded a curve and found a cougar standing in the middle of the trail sniffing at something. It jumped when it saw my partner and took off down the trail towards where I was hiking. We made it back without incident and I'll never know for sure but I think I walked right by a cougar in the brush. We've hiked that trail many times since and we've even seen cougar prints in the snow a few times. We no longer split up while hiking and when it feels too quiet, we turn around and hike home. diving the day before a hurricane on a small South Pacific island. Out of nowhere a black and white sea snake, venomous, wrapped itself around my arm. Apparently this happens from time to time before major storms they can sense it and look for things that are heading towards the shore so that they don't have to put in so much effort to get out of the sea. As soon as I was in the shallows it uncurled and headed up the beach where it hid under a breadfruit tree. I thought I was going to get bitten to death by a snake at sea. Turns out I was just a taxi for a very calm but rather rushed reptile. I was diving in a local pond with a group of much more advanced divers, cave divers, than I, just an advanced certification at the time. I am leading the dive as to get used to pressures and responsibilities of heading the procession, they are mentoring me. It is a Texas puddle, visibility 10 feet max, not too deep, maybe 25 feet. The known horrible visibility makes it impossible to navigate by compass, we follow a line, string, put by other divers. These lines go from one sunken item to another. So, I know I am about to hit a small sunken boat, don't remember which one, there are a few similar in a row in a same state of decay. So, I am first in the group, I get to the boat and see someone's black army boot sticking out from the inner quarters. Curious thing is, it looks somewhat new, not like items you find on the bottom. Hard to see, too much muck in the water. So, I touch the boot, thinking it is by itself but it won't lift, like it is attached to something heavy. I put my hand further in and feel the leg continuing out, pants, the calf, and I see the second leg now. 
I turn around and show a sign for the emergency ascent to the group behind me. Everyone has a sour face, no one wants to surface but it is a rule that if one says up, others in a group must abort, no questions. They wanted me to explain with signs why, but what is a diver's sign for a cadaver? I feel like I rush toward the surface, even though trying to stay calm and take time. So, we are on the lake's surface, I have this adrenaline rush, can't breath enough. So, I tell them there is a body down there. I see rolling eyes from everyone, once they see I am serious. A fun bunch, right? So, I describe in detail what I saw. We go down, I don't lead anymore, we make a group search pattern for the line. But once we locate it, we don't know if we should go forward or backwards, as there are a number of boats on the line and who knows in which the body is in and how far we drifted while talking it out on the surface. Well, we find all boats before finding the original one, of cause. So, our customary leader goes into the cabin of the boat and we wait. I'd say he was rather courageous at this point, went right in. Then he emerges from the cloud of muck and tells us all to surface. So, gluing information together from what we learned later on. Turns out the police or some other agency had a body recovery training in the same lake the same day. When they went for lunch, they stuffed their fully dressed anatomically correct rubber doll in one of the sunken boats for a few hours for safekeeping. Well, I died a little that day. I saved someone from drowning while scuba diving. Person had an epileptic seizure at 85 feet of water in a pitch black cavern that I was diving also. I was hovering above just watching the flashlights move about when I noticed one flashlight not moving. I swam down and was met with the other diver with no regulator in their mouth, eyes open and just on their knees. The diver's buddy was next to them and in complete shock to what was going on and was not assisting whatsoever. 15 years of diving and instructor training came over me like it was second nature. I thought her regulator just came out so I popped mine out and offered it to her, that when I noticed she had done mentally checked out. I popped my number 2 regulator in my mouth and attempted to put my number 1 regulator in her mouth but her teeth were completely clenched. I then pressed the purged button to get air into her mouth and noticed her cheeks moving so I know air was getting in there. That was good enough for me, I then grabbed her under her arm and get the regulator flowing in her mouth and swan to the opening of the cavern and then up over 60 feet to get her to the surface. One on the surface did everything I was trained to do, inflate BC, dumped her weights, got her on her back and started towing to land. As I'm towing her in she is regurgitating all the water she swallowed and inhaled, it seemed like gallons of water. Got her to land where other divers assisted me in getting all her gear off. She was breathing fine and alive but in shock for a while and slowly came around like nothing happened. We were very lucky that we were only 10 minutes into the dive or for sure we would have both been bent and spending time in a hyperbaric chamber. The crazy thing is she didn't tell anyone she had epilepsy and when we later reviewed her consent form she checked off no to epilepsy. I put myself at risk shooting up to the surface like that, but if I came across that situation again I would not hesitate to save someone's life. Not my story but my parents. They like to scuba dive when traveling and have gone several times over the years. Once they visited Mexico and went diving there before I was born. I'm not sure where they were exactly, but my mom was slightly lower down than my dad and looking at the ocean floor. He was looking up and around. My mom had on a gold necklace that was floating in the water around her, it was a sunny day and a fairly shallow dive so it was sparkling. From my mom's puff. She was going along having a grand old time looking at the sea critters below, when suddenly my dad grabbed her and started frantically shaking her arm to get her attention. She looked up and a barracuda was directly in front of her, closer than was comfortable and staring intently, scary teeth on full display. It was focused on the shiny necklace and was just hovering there, transfixed. 
She slowly moved up her hand to cover the necklace and they slowly and calmly moved away from it and it took off without bothering them anymore, but still pretty unsettling and taught my mom to be a little more aware of her surroundings when diving. I dive a lot, several times a week. My area has a lot of theoretically dangerous things, sharks and barracudas, marais and stingrays, blue ringed octopuses, cone snails, box jellies, siphonophores of all kinds, sea snakes, stone fishes and scorpion fishes, venomous catfish, crown of thorn starfish and various sea urchins that can hurt you in several different ways, titan triggerfish and so on and so on. But only one thing has ever got me. Twice. Are you ready? Clownfish. Like Nemo. They are territorial and brave and will get in your face if you're near their anemones. I usually respect their space, but I was distracted watching something else a couple of times, and turns out they will actually bite if you don't leave their space fast enough. For real though, I don't have particular horror stories, but the scariest moments are probably when I get caught in strong currents and have to crawl on the bottom to fight it, going hand over hand like I'm climbing a horizontal wall. Despite what a lot of people tend to think, especially looking at the daunting list of dangerous animals in my area, sea critters aren't your problem. You leave them alone and it's fine. Sea conditions like waves or currents, and above all human error, are the real killers. Edit. I just remembered an incident that did scare me, it was a human error slash equipment failure issue. When you're diving, you want to ascend to the surface slowly. This is because under pressure your blood and tissues can hold more gases, in particular inert nitrogen from your compressed air, dissolved in it than when you're at the surface, and as you ascend to the surface these dissolved gases have to return to being gases. If you're slow, you just breath it out as you come up. But if you're too fast they turn into bubbles of gas in your arteries and veins before they can be vented out. This causes embolisms as well as decompression sickness, aka the bends. I was diving with a friend at about 25 meters, tilde 82 feet, when her old beat up BCD, the vest that you can inflate with air to control your buoyancy, started to inflate on its own. This has happened to me before as well but I just disconnected the air hose from the BC immediately and carried on, and went on to do about 10 dives with a busted BC that I only inflated manually. She didn't think to do that, or didn't have time to do that, this happened very quickly. I saw that she was having buoyancy control issues, she was upside down kicking to try to stay down, but in the few seconds it took for me to realize how bad the problem was, she was already at the surface. Basically I quickly glanced around to see if there was a rock I could use to weigh her down and when I turned back she was gone. I followed her up, but not too quickly, and even so my dive computer was beeping warnings at me. When we met up I wondered why she didn't use her dump valve, there is a valve at the bottom of the BC exactly for releasing air when you are feet up, especially since she was experienced and should know to do that. Then I saw that the string you pull to open the valve was missing, so it was literally impossible to dump the air when oriented that way. So check your gear before you use it. I was pretty worried that she would come down with the bends, but she was fine. People are often worried that I dive alone a lot, but honestly all of my scariest and most anxious moments were problems occurring with other people. I wear contacts so getting water in my mask is extra bad as I can't open my eyes underwater. Shortly after being told about a shark colliding with my friend from behind and removing his mask I am pretty scared about this, not sharks in general, and I see a shark heading for me. They are curious, they often shoulder bump you as they turn at the last second. But she wasn't changing course. I stayed calm and still as long as I could and at the last second before she hit my mask I ducked. Except instead of ducking under I just headbutted her right in the nose. Everyone saw and thinks it was the funniest thing ever. I may be the only person alive who headbutted an 11 foot shark in the nose but it was because I was scared she would take my goggles off.
free dove to about 160 feet in Dean's Blue Hole in the Bahamas. It's where a lot of the free diving world records are set, super neat place, Google a picture. Anyway I'd never really been past 100 feet freediving, but this was the perfect place to do it. No current, there's ropes to keep you straight and allow a slight pull back up. Scary part is that you become pretty strongly negatively buoyant after like 60 feet, so you're basically hauling ass down while doing nothing and using very little air. So I'm dazed out a bit feeling good and counting the lines that mark depth and all of a sudden feel pressure like my trachea is going to collapse and wake up and realize I've counted to the line that's around 160 feet or so. Very scary moment because I wasn't sure if my body could take the depth or if I had gone too far and wouldn't have enough air to get back up, which is a much slower and more air intensive process. I got the bends once. I was careful. Followed my charts and my computer. Had appropriate depths and surface time. But I didn't drink enough water so I was all out of whack. Felt fine until I got home, mild headache. Then I woke up and it was just pain in my left arm. Elbows. Fingers. Couldn't even bend them without bad pain. My headache was intense and I was so dizzy. Called my older more experienced dive buddy and I got rushed to the hospital. Docs got me hooked up in fluids, checked my dive logs while the decompression chamber was set up. And then got me in there with a nurse. 8 hours in a tube about the length of a car but as wide as maybe a double bed? I was on oxygen and hooked up to an 4 and it was so loud, with all the air rushing in. As soon as I got to depth the pain vanished. It was crazy. I'm fine now obviously. But I wasn't allowed to dive for a month which sucked but hey. The dives were pretty great. Dude, Dan Insurance is a lifesaver. I'm not very experienced diving seeing as I only got certified last October, but my instructor told me the story of how he'd been dry suit diving in Norway and underestimated how long it would take to get back to the surface. He was probably 35 from the surface when he had to cut his belt and let the monkey brain take over to get to the surface. He called Dan as soon as he got out of the dry suit and went to get his treatment the next day. According to him, his legs seized up at the ankles and knees, as well as his hands, so it was a weird time getting to the pressure tank for treatment. One time I was on a beach in Thailand. It was dark and nobody was around but me. I decided I would have a little beach fire and chill. Went looking for some sticks. Reached for a stick and heard a hiss. My hand was super close to grabbing a sea crate. I think about this often, I would have died for sure. Far from anywhere and there's no anti-venom anyway. I dive in lakes in my area in the Netherlands, and was guiding a kid who just started their diving training, about 14 years old, I was 20 at the time. Horrible visibility, could barely look further than 1.5 meters. This kid was on a line, and swimming behind me, when I saw something emerge from the darkness, super pale, it reflected the light of my flashlight. I get closer, it's a head. I'm thinking, Ah, suicide. First thing I do is make sure the kid didn't see anything, and tell slash sign to them to look the other way, while trying not to freak out myself. I get closer, and it turns out to be a freaking mannequin, fully clothed, weighed down by stones. So I cut it loose, take it and bring it up to the surface, of course freaking out some other divers already up there. Never found out where it came from but it's now standing in our bar, wearing some old diving gear. We were on a ship in the Mediterranean and were called up by a small shabby looking dive vessel who asked if we had a doctor on board. We did, so they boated a diver over to us. Doctor quickly confirmed he had the bends and needed a chamber, 
She did what she could for the guy and told the captain of the other vessel that they needed to go to port ASAP and get him proper treatment. He refused, they had three more days of diving to do before they could go back. We tried convincing him but he said that it wasn't an option. We couldn't force him so we notified an Italian Navy vessel in the area about it. It was in international waters so don't know if they managed to do anything about it, hope the guy is alright. Not my story, but my dad's. He was just telling me about this last night. In order to get his diving certification, he needed to complete three dives in open water. During the second test, remember this is only the second time he's ever been scuba diving in open water, there had been a massive storm so the water off of New Jersey was pitch black, even during the day. They couldn't see anything at all, not even the hand of the instructor guiding him to the bottom. He didn't feel the bottom until he hit it with his face. To complete the test, they had to reach the ocean floor, take off their masks, and clear it by blowing air into it, then put it back on and go back to the surface. He did the mask test fine, not that the instructor could tell, and they all went up to the surface. He said at one point he couldn't tell which direction was up, but when they all finally hit the surface, there was a massive ship coming through the channel directly at them. The instructor screamed swim. And they all had to bust ass to try and avoid the ship. Dad ended up getting whacked by the side of the ship but otherwise fine. I just can't imagine coming up from a pitch black hell's cape to come face to face with a massive ship about to kill you. A freshwater pond fish. I have a fishing float tube, it's a pair on inflatable pontoons inside a U-shaped polyurethane sleeve and there's a stadium seat made of styrofoam in the middle to sit on. Your butt is in the water about an inch and your legs dangle into the water and you wear flippers to paddle your way backwards like a nautilus. It's a peaceful and cooling way to fish, your legs are in the cool water so it's like a primitive body cooler during hot weather and quiet because you only paddle with your feet so you don't scare the fish. Boaters and jet skiers seem to get great joy from running circles around me, literal circles so that the wake from their circling makes my float very unstable. They always stay just out of shouting range, I always want to know what's so fun about going around and around someone trying to fish from a stupid contraption? Trying to sink me? Then what? Isn't that illegal? Not like I can catch them and make them pay for my sink float. They could get back to shore in a way before I could swim back even with flippers. Such assholes, something about having the money to throw away on those things makes people just think everyone who doesn't have that kind of money is just their plaything. I think you have to be stupid not to be aware that things can go wrong. Scuba is a dangerous sport. You being forgotten is very unlikely. They typically do a roll call when you go out with the boats, so they're gonna know if you're not on the boat. Plus, and I am generalizing here, you typically don't go that far away from the boat during night dives, compared to day dives, so the captain and the mates typically have a general idea of where people are, again, this is a massive generalization, but this is why you should go out with reputable companies. You'd typically also be with a dive master, so as long as you stick with them and can see their beam you should be fine. I've done one nighttime shore dive but I've talked to people about it so, to my knowledge, unless you get caught in a rip or something, you can generally figure your way back to shore. I got separated from my group briefly but we had glow sticks on our tanks so I was able to find my way back to them. Plus, we were only in about 8 to 12 feet deep so if I needed to I could pop up and look around for them without having to worry about getting bent. In terms of predators, yeah light can attract them. But I feel like unless you're in known sharky waters you don't really come across them, at least in my experience. In the course of around 35 dives I only saw one reef shark, and as soon as it saw us it bolted, three bonnet heads, and a bunch of nurses, and if you know that it's sharky waters, I would recommend not diving there if you're nervous. 
I also feel like people who do night dives are typically not as spastic as a whole when compared to day divers, so there are less dying fish vibrations getting sent out. For your flashlight dying, my recommendation is to always carry two lights. A primary light, and then some kind of backup light that, even if you can't use it to navigate, if you got above water the captain would be able to see the light, also carry a BCD so you can reflect the light off of that if needed. Also, the boats typically have some kind of light, and some have them tied to their ladder slash line, so you'll at least have a stable point to look at. My final bit of advice is go with someone you trust. I was in a situation where my buddy and I were allowed to go on our own without a guide, and I had complete faith in her. I was still a really new diver at this point, technically I'm still fairly new, but I knew that in any worst case scenario she would have my back, and I would have hers. Those are my two cents. Went night diving in Cozumel, Mexico last year. That trip was the second time I ever dove, the first one being earlier that day. I was with two semi-experienced divers and an instructor. I forgot to mention that the instructor took us out on his personal boat with personal dive equipment after hours to make a quick buck, I shouldn't have been allowed at the depth we went in time of day with my lack of experience. Can attest that night dives are crazy, especially not knowing what you will point your flashlight at. Great experience, just not sure if I'd do it at night again, but if I did, I would not take my girlfriend. Spent 98% of the dive with my flashlight focused on her and her surroundings, who was also an inexperienced diver. My biology teacher told us that she once was swimming in the south of the Philippines because she was trying to find an elusive seahorse and she went quite deep at night when they are more active and she got attacked by a shark and her team got out fast. The next day they found a turtle that was bitten in half shell included that was pretty big and it's it's supposedly the last time she went diving in that area. I was diving under an oil rig between Long Beach and Catalina Island. I was collecting sea scallops at around 60 feet or so and knowing that there were seals all around I always kept an eye out for sharks, you just can't help but think about them. So I was just about to finish my dive but I was looking for one more scallop for dinner and I saw a blur swoosh right by me just in front of my face. My initial immediate reaction was shark, but it was just a damn seal playing with me. I literally was screaming underwater for a couple of seconds. Funny thing is I have over 25 logged open water dives, some at night, mostly around Catalina and I never saw a shark. This happened to me once. I forgot to take my silver bracelet off. It had a crystal charm on it. This was in St. Thomas I believe. Anyway. I saw a barracuda and was pretty excited. Until it zeroed in on my hand and shot towards me. I quickly covered my bracelet with my other hand when it was close. It kind of watched me for a few minutes but eventually just swam away. I awkwardly swam back to the boat, still covering my bracelet. And that is why I no longer wear jewelry or even have shiny painted nails when I swim in the ocean. I was a little freaked out by mostly I just laughed at my stupidity. My only experience with a barracuda was when myself and my brother went wakeboarding in the creek in Dubai, UAE, we were born and raised there, we were having a great time jumping over the wake and the boat driver was helping by playing with the throttle to create some challenges for us. Anyway, while I was in the boat and my brother was in the water jumping around on his wakeboard, a barracuda suddenly leaps out of the water in front of him, must have been chasing a school of fish, my brother's wakeboard hits this thing as he was mid-jump to and decapitates its head clean off. 
He fell over from the impact and hadn't registered what made him fall as he was focused on the water a few feet in front of him and not directly looking at his bindings and board but his scream as this kuda head slowly floated towards him still is one of the funniest memories I have to this day 15 years later. It wasn't exactly a deep dive, but it was one of the most terrifying moments of my life. I was on a beach dive with my parents, having swum from the beach out to a small reef and then descending. It was only a few minutes after getting down to the reef that something started going on with my parents. My mother was agitated and clutching her chest. We surfaced and she started spitting up dark liquid and struggling to breathe. Fortunately, it was a busy beach and after we inflated an emergency buoy, lifeguards rushed out and carried her back to the shore where an ambulance waited. It turned out she'd had swimmer's edema induced by the greater pressure. Things turned out fine, but having a medical emergency underwater in the ocean is especially level of scary. I was snorkeling on the Great Barrier Reef a good 14 or 15 years ago, before the majority of it was dead, and has drifted quite far away from the boat. When it was time to get back aboard I was the last to reach the boat again. I'm about 20 feet or so from the ladders, flailing about a bit, thanks to cramp in one of my feet, and there is a giant barracuda floating under the boat not too far away from me, looking right at me. Creepy looking thing. It didn't come near me and I got aboard with no problems. A little later, while we were eating, this was one of those group trips on a biggish boat, the crew started throwing bits of chicken overboard, not sure that was in any way the right thing to do but I was like 14 at the time, and it was lunging out of the water with all its creepy teeth out. Didn't like the feeling of having been in the water on my own with that thing. Not me but my brother, and not deep sea, sorry. He was 18, part of the dive club at his school. They went on a diving trip. The crew that handled the dive counted heads wrong and halfway through the dive the boat went back to shore without them. So there they were two kilometers from shore with their only option to swim back. There were about five of them, two girls three guys. All of them between 15 to 18 years slash o. About halfway through one of the girls couldn't swim anymore and started crying, my brother along with another guy swam with her, dragging her along, making sure she didn't drown. Everyone made it out okay. Worst part, school tried to hide it, and had the audacity to suspend my brother from school for catching him with a beer while on the trip. Needless to say they were in deep shit when it came out. Not sure exactly what happened though. My only incident diving was when my buddy and I were in super low vis, less than 5 feet, I was looking away from him as we were headed toward our destination. I ended up getting too close and his fin caught my reg hose and ripped it out of my mouth. Reg went into free flow and pushed itself behind my head, so even though I got my secondary in without issue, I was still losing air quickly. And I had to catch up to my buddy to let him know what happened dot all in all. Everything turned out all right, but it was certainly a sobering experience. I took an advanced scuba class in college and one of our dives was a night dive. It was in one of the Great Lakes, so not a tropical place with lots of fish. I could not judge how deep I was without looking at my dive computer and vertigo was a serious problem when I wasn't at the surface or on the bottom. It was the only time I saw fish close up while diving. Several swam within inches of my mask without any fear, probably because they didn't recognize us as a threat. It was by far the creepiest dive I'd ever done. Like a horror movie. As a grown-ass adult, three quarters of the way to my bachelor's degree, I knew there weren't any monsters lurking, but I was so terrified when I thought of what might appear through the darkness at the edge of our flashlight beams. I would never do another night dive, but I never felt so alive as when I got out of the water afterward. 
It was honestly one of the few times in my life when I've experienced outright euphoria without being on a substance of some kind. One time I went snorkeling in decent visibility and saw a seal swim about 10 feet in front of me right where the visibility started dropping through a bunch of seaweed, so it was just a dark silhouette moving extremely fast through the water. I thought that was scary but I'd probably shit my pants on a night dive, F that. I wear heavy prescription lenses and can't wear contact lenses. Halfway through a week-long liveaboard dive trip, someone dropped a tank on my prescription mask and shattered it. I usually had a second set with me, but could not find them and only brought one, because hey, nothing had ever happened before. I am functionally blind without corrective lenses, I can see colors and that's about it, starting about 5 inches from my face. I was devastated but decided to go diving anyway, with my husband as my seeing eye diver. I could see my gauges, so I felt reasonably safe. It was among the most amazing three days of diving I've ever had. I saw the colors, shapes, and movement. Without being focused on the details, I actually took many of the best underwater photos I'd ever taken. I wasn't worried about focusing on a particular coral or fish, I was looking at the larger color patterns. So it didn't turn out to be the disaster I'd thought it was. Only thing that really scares me is lung expansion injuries. So the one time I was freaked out was swimming near a wreck at about 100 feet I lost perspective and buoyancy control and suddenly realized I had surfaced about 40 feet in 30s or less. Visions of the bends and a pop lung instantly came to mind and dropped a ton of air from my BC to get back to depth in a hurry. Got a massive squeeze from it in my ears, but it gave me a chance to calm the F down and get a better sense of where I was and re-establish buoyancy control. Bottom line, the scariest things that can happen while driving is the shit you can do to yourself. I was on a night dive looking for a resident six-gill shark when a large gray animal darted past me, just barely illuminated by my light. It was way faster than I was told this shark would be and I couldn't quite make out the size. Then it happened again on the other side. Both times it was in my peripheral vision, barely illuminated by my forward aim spotlight, and very fast. For some reason when I got to the bottom. I decided just to sit on my knees and aim the light in one direction until something happened. As it turned out, the beast was a harbor seal using the light to find fish to eat. He or she hung out with us for a while which was a pretty cool experience. We never found the shark but I did think I was being hunted for a bit. The weather had been pretty hot and the water temp was also around 26 C. We'd done a dive and a long swim in the morning. We then headed out for our second dive and the boat dropped us in the wrong spot. So we had to swim against a massive current to get to our intended site. Halfway into the swim I just felt like I needed a nap. And so, I closed my eyes and did exactly that. It felt so peaceful. I immediately dropped down to an even deeper depth and was lucky that one of the guys on the dive turned around at that moment and saw what was happening. He swam as fast as he could towards me and caught me. He asked if I was okay, I said I was and passed out again, this time spitting my reg out and started blowing bubbles. He then went behind me, shoved my reg back in, wrapped his arms around me and took me straight to the surface. He saved my life. Not exactly deep but I was doing my certification dive for my potty basic open water diver certification. I was at about 35 feet when my regulator started free flowing. We'd been taught to put our tongues against the roof of our mouth to still breathe in that scenario and it worked just fine in the 70 degree pool. Unfortunately I was in a 40 degree lake, 
the temperature of which adds a bit of stress and anxiety no matter the depth. I was fine until the tongue technique didn't work and I grabbed my backup regulator. When I tried to clear it of water and breathe from the backup yet still managed to suck water, I panicked. Thankfully it being a certification dive and all, there was a dive master with my little group. I signaled an emergency ascent and he and I shot to the surface. I was in a complete panic like I've never known before or since. I was convinced I was dead. Once we got to the surface he was smart enough to reach between my flailing arms and inflate my BCD. After a few seconds he was able to calm me down, but I was unable to complete the dive. Every time my face went under the surface, I started having a panic attack. Eventually I pushed through. Before it was said and done, I got my advanced certification, which involved a dive to 110 feet and a number of other challenges. Unfortunately after that accident, diving gave me pretty bad anxiety and got to a point where pushing through was no longer worth it. It's been a long time since then and I'm not sure how I'd react now. Maybe after all this time I'd enjoy it again. I was diving in the early 90s off the coast of Florida. I had been using a spearfish ineffectually for a few minutes when I heard a strange grinding noise to my right. I turned my head to see an enormous set of barracuda jaws grinding just inches from my face. I still recall the fishes I rotating around to check me out as if considering it should take a bite or not. I was babysitting this diver for my instructor, I'm a dive master, who was notoriously nervous, clumsy and an all-round bad diver. It was a simple and pleasant enough dive up until the end. We were doing our 5 meter safety stop, for those who don't know it's a stop you do at the end of every dive so that your tissues can rebalance and it's very important in preventing the bends, which is gas bubbles in the bloodstream, and this guy just freaks out. Starts nervously fiddling with his BCD for no reason, then inflated and shoots to the surface. I immediately signed to him to stop, hold on to his BCD and use the dump valve to try to keep him at 5 meters, for his own safety. He panics even more, freaks out and starts inflating even more. At this point we are both darting up and down like a ping pong ball as he keeps trying to inflate and I keep trying to dump the air. My ears have never popped so much and my computer was beeping all kinds of danger alert sounds. I don't even remember how it ended now, this was 10 years ago, but luckily not with either one of us coming down with the bends. Having said all of this, I sure do miss diving. I used to dive but don't anymore. It was my descents and ascents that did me in. I'm a serious overthinker and haven't been the strongest swimmer. So I would unknowingly tense up at the beginning and end of every dive. For non-divers, it also meant I was more buoyant because tensing up means you're holding more air in your body. And you float a lot easier. Terrifying dives, I got left on the surface once. I was having trouble getting below the surface for some reason. Then I saw the rest of the group at the bottom starting the dive, if you dive, Check out Cozumel, great diving. So I got more anxious. The dive master misunderstood my ex and gave him more weight, that he didn't need, when my ex asked to get more for me. He dropped down with the extra weight. The dive boat thought everyone was gone but luckily saw slash heard me and let me back on. Back on the boat, I continued my freak out because I worried about what everyone would think when they couldn't find me. One of the most experienced divers volunteered to come up and check on me. He ended up getting me back in the water and held my hand through the rest of the dive. It calmed my spirits a bit. I did a safety stop upside down smile at the end of the dive, you make safety stops to help prevent the bends or any other issues. If you're a hardcore, more technical diver, you may have more than one at various depths, but for most recreational scuba divers, it's usually 5 minutes at 15 feet. Because of the previously mentioned anxiety, 
I would worry about getting the bends from a bad safety stop, which would make me start to go to the surface faster. So, I often had a dive master hanging on to me to make sure I relaxed and bobbed at 25 feet. One dive, I just couldn't get it to work out. They did the best they could. Which ended up being me facing down with my head at 15 feet and my body swaying above me. Once I'd get to depth, I enjoyed the fish and turtles and coral and all of that. But the anxiety I went through every time is why I no longer dive. I did something similar snorkeling in Hawaii. I was following a sea turtle, just checking it out, and it eventually ducked into an underwater nook I wasn't following it through. I was getting short on air, so I turned around to go back up, to find I'm like three to four stories deep. I'm a fine swimmer, though I'd never gone down below 15 feet before this experience. I freak the hell out and start hauling us back to the surface. Things started to dim out to tunnel vision about 20 feet from the surface, but I made it. Freaked me out and made me hyper aware of checking yet depth frequently from there on out. Was doing a boat dive and came up to find 20 foot swells. We just had to chill for a while down under until the boat would calm down and we could actually grab the ladder without getting smashed. I remember seeing the ladder going up and down 6 to 8 feet at a time. I finally grabbed the rope and climbed up as fast as I could. I hung onto the ladder and the boat crew grabbed my BCD and hauled me out of the water and onto the swim step. Half the divers puked on the way back into port. That was the roughest conditions that I have ever been diving in. I did a shipwreck night dive on New Year's Eve one year, and it was spooky as hell. 80 feet down, really small plane. Visibility was obviously not great, I've only done this one night dive, so these slow moving fish would come looming out of the dark. Scarier to me was getting back on the boat, because it got really stormy. You'd be looking up at the ladder, and it had come crashing down right next to you. The waves were crazy. My brother got hit by the ladder, but not too badly, and we all managed to get back okay. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.